Okay, we'll uh, maybe give it another 30 seconds or so. Then we'll make a start. <clears throat> okay, uh, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Ricky Mahay. Uh, I'm one of the practice account managers here for our clients uh, within the UK and Ireland. I'm also joined by my colleagues uh, Yuane and my co-host James Wright uh, from our education and media team who will be uh, helping to moderate the Q&A. So following on from our successful CWX conference earlier this month, uh, I'm very pleased to announce the launch of our fully compliant and intuitive to use Caseware ISQM, uh, Caseware SQM app uh, for enhanced audit quality and uh, risk management. Um, by way of introduction, the app was developed by Caseware South Africa and due to the huge success of um, the app within that region, together with the, um, the huge demand from our own customer base to um, bring a system of quality management offering to the UK, uh, it was decided to make the app available for global use and to meet the needs of multiple uh, quality standards uh, around the world. Um, to, to very briefly summarize, uh, Caseware SQM will allow you to design, implement and manage your own risk-based assessments uh, to, to supplement your own uh, current audits. It will achieve this uh, for a workflow style approach and via five easy to use modules, which uh, Yuane uh, will, will take you through very shortly. Um, the five modules uh, include design and operate, which, as the name suggests, allows you to design your risk objectives uh, with responses, uh, creating tasks to allocate uh, procedures to staff members uh, and the ability uh, 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 to track and review those responses. Finally, uh, you'll have the uh, ability to monitor and evaluate uh, the status of, of those activities in, in real time. Um, case where SQM supports uh, multiple uh, audit methodologies globally uh, and is applicable uh, to firms of all sizes, uh, irrespective of whether you are a single partner practice or a large uh, network of firms. The exciting news, which I know uh, many of our cloud customers uh, in particular will be pleased to hear, um, is that uh, Caseware SQM is, is cloud hosted uh, on your uh, on your trusted Caseware Cloud platform. Uh, therefore, with uh, the SQM app being part of the same family of apps uh, within um, the Caseware Cloud ecosystem, uh, it means you have access to the same intelligent collaborative features such as sign-offs uh, as, as you currently have um, uh, with your existing Caseware uh, Cloud products. This should also mean that your team ends up finding the navigation around the uh, SQM app uh, to be familiar and uh, and relatively uh, straightforward. And, and certainly this is the very purpose of the Caseware Cloud ecosystem where uh, all apps are designed to retain uh, a similar look and feel uh, to help reduce the overall learning requirement uh, and ultimately help you to deliver faster and uh, more, uh, official, um, more efficient work. Um, and of course, with, with, with Caseware SQM being powered by the cloud, uh, it does also bring that added uh, benefit of compliance and uh, regulatory changes to the international standards of quality management uh, being updated automatically. So no more manual updates. Um, and, and this I know will be uh, a key benefit for um, many of you who have mentioned to me personally that uh, their firm are currently adopting a, a manual approach to SQM and keen to, to switch to a, a more uh, efficient and intelligent uh, alternative. Um, before I hand over to uh, UNA, uh, should you wish to purchase the SQM app, you will require uh, an additional, um, not additional, an accompanying uh, Caseware Cloud user license in addition to uh, paying the uh, SQM uh, app fee. For those on the call that don't currently use us um, for our cloud audits uh, suite of products, be assured there is no mandatory requirement uh, to switch your audit tool to, to cloud, uh, Caseware Cloud Audit. Caseware SQM is an independent app, so it will complement your current audit tools um, and, and approaches. 
even if you are only using uh, our Caseware Cloud for our standalone apps, uh, such as the Disclosure Checklist or Extend uh, Prepared by Client, you will find that most of the SQM app fee um, will have been absorbed anyway um, through through those standalone licenses, um, as they will require a, a you know a Caseware Cloud um, user license. Um, and you won't have to pay for that case where cloud user fee twice. So in this, these cases where you are already paying for a case where cloud app, um, case where SQM does become a, a relatively uh, cost effective uh, option. Um, with regards to the procurement process, uh, it's actually very straightforward. You will create a, a case where cloud account if you don't already have one uh, to enable a, a my case where online shopping portal facility. Um, you will then log into my case where uh, select the chosen quantity of SQM to your shopping cart. Any volume discounts will, will clearly show there too. Um, and once uh, payment has been processed, uh, the app will appear for you to assign to your uh, Caseware Cloud staff users. Uh, if you do not have access to Caseware Cloud, um, you can see my contact. Uh, we can see the generic um, sales box uh, email address there, sales hyphen uk at caseware.com uh, or you can contact me personally or um, another member of uh, the caseware team for for further instructions finally uh, as i know this will be very important uh, in the, your decision making process um, with regards to pricing uh, sqm is charged on a sliding scale and is a per user annual license subscription uh, the current charge is, is 110 pounds uh, per user for between uh, one to nine users uh, 95 pounds for for 10 plus uh, users um, with further uh, reductions uh, along the way based on uh, on volume. If you don't already have one, as I mentioned before, you'll, you'll need to uh, acquire a case where cloud user license, which as of today is uh, 165 pounds uh, per user. I think that's everything from me for now. Um, UNA will be taking you through the majority of the session. I believe we have 90 minutes allocated in total. Um, so there should be plenty of time um, for, for Q&A, but if we run out, then um, we will come uh, run out of time. We'll come back to you afterwards. With that said, uh, I'm now going to hand over to James to give you some Q&A instructions. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining, and we hope you enjoyed the demonstration. Um, over to you, James. Thank you, Ricky. Um, yeah, just a quick one before we crack on with the demonstration. If you do have any questions uh, throughout today's webinar, feel free to, to ask them using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, that's both on desktop and mobile, the screenshots there, so it should be just at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm not ignoring you throughout the uh, webinar if we don't respond. Uh, we're going to do the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar, so uh, we'll aim to get through uh, as many of your questions then. Um, however, there will be a recording of this webinar made available afterwards, and any questions that we don't answer will be uh, linked uh, to that video via a handout document. So we'll get everyone's questions answered. Don't worry about that. It might just take a little bit longer to do, um, do them if we have a large quantity. Uh, but with that said, that's everything covered there. I'm gonna pass over to Yuan A, who's gonna share her screen and uh, we'll get cracking with the demonstration. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to introduce you to the Caseware SQM app. As Ricky's mentioned, it's an independent app on the cloud. Um, so it's it's really fantastic to be able to share this and to actually make it available to um, all countries. You'll soon see all the different languages and that's even more exciting, um, reading about your product in all kinds of languages that you cannot even understand. But right, let's get going. So first of all, just something about myself. My name is Joanna Skreder. Um, James asked me where about am I? I'm in Africa, but I'm in Cape Town. So that is is maybe something to be, I don't know, either interested about or maybe a little bit jealous. Um, but I can say that we've got a little bit of rain today. So it's not necessarily perfect summer weather today. I'm an independent consultant. And with Case for Africa, I perform the role of the content owner. So I've been very closely involved with the development of the SQM app for Case for Africa. Now, just a little bit of information about the um, assurance uh, suite of products. Within Caseway Africa, we have in the assurance uh, suite, we've obviously got an, an audit um, engagement documentation product, etc. But the SQM app falls within that assurance sphere. And as you'll see soon, it's mostly because it will be audit firms, firms providing assurance that are um, required to have the SQM app. 
All right. So what's great about the SQM is that the responsible parties are empowered to actually target their efforts towards the higher risky areas within the firm and increasing, increasing their efforts and constantly improving the quality within the firm. Um, we really worked hard at helping you to continuously improve on the quality whenever you come across any problems. So we've provided a lot of content. I want to say example content, but it's actually, it, it's a library of content, but there's also required or compulsory content. The content has been split, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, within those six major um, bars or, or groups of, of uh, the themes within the ISQM1 standard. Uh, which is their governance and leadership ethics, et cetera. And we've really worked hard at bringing together the content that you can basically adopt as is. Of course, you will modify it to your firm, whether again, whether you're a big firm, really small firm, have staff, don't have staff, you will modify your, the, the content as is necessary. But we've really tried to help you to get, to get going from the get go to really start the system being compliant already, having lots of examples, lots of content there that, that you don't have to go and think up the stuff all by yourself or go paragraph for paragraph through the standard to make sure that you write the content from scratch so so that content is really one of our unique uh, features that really helps you to to implement um, a compliance system really really quickly there's also a built-in risk assessment process i'll show you where to change the little um uh, but changes that you can actually modify it for your own firm but what's really helpful is that you don't have to again go and design something or, or develop something outside of the system it's really built into the system so that you can not only have the content but actually do the risk assessment and design your responses in in, in response to those risks without having to even leave the system or leave the software or to think of it about by yourself. So that's really, really helpful to help you to come up with the, with the information. So I've mentioned libraries, but we also went from the standard and everything that has a requirement is also included in the product. So I'll show you the different um, examples in there. Then next up are the regions that are currently supporting. So this is an ever increasing list. Currently, we are supporting 15 main regions throughout the world, through our distributor network in nine different languages, and again, increasing. You can see currently there are some translations being done. Um, and in our discussions with the network firms, we, we really just saw that this cannot just be in English. And so we've really expanded this to accommodate every single region that is interested and again, the languages and more than that, even where there is localization required to do that. To give an example, in South Africa, we've got an Auditing Professions Act with specific requirements for auditors. And so we even incorporated some of those requirements into risks, policies, procedures, etc. So that's that's really the purpose of having the different standards, if we can call it like that, or then at least indicating your region and the content that you want to activate for your specific firm or your network of firms. Of course, if you are a network of firms, you can activate all the relevant languages and regions and then make sure that everybody in your firm will be compliant. Right, next up, the vision of this product is really not only to provide compliance, but also an experience that will delight users in this workflow of the quality product. So we assist with facets in managing accounting practices and SQM will therefore embed itself for all of the staff as a proactive management tool that facilitates an iterative system of quality management. And, and I want to stress the proactiveness in that you really can um, as very often actually foresee problems or fix them the moment they happen. Um, and you don't have to just wait for your monitoring to happen once a year or whenever they, that comes around. And incorporating Casper, the, the Casper ecosystem into the SKM quality app, we aim to provide firms with a solution that is integrated into your daily tasks. Ricky confirmed the collaboration of Casper Cloud, and we've even used that in the product so that you don't now have to go and create a new way of notifying people of, of tasks or, or any elements of the SQM app. Now, the question then probably is, so why should I buy the SQM app? 
And the main reason, as most of you would know, um, I understand that you also had to already implement the quality management standards from December last year. So you are probably already familiar with the requirements of ISQM 1, ISQM 2, and now also ISA 220. Now, the driving force for the SQM app was initially ISQM 1. So that is, app is designed to comply with or achieve the objective of the ISQM 1 objective. But then also, so with ISCM2 and the engagement quality reviews, the, the ISCM2 standard also requires a lot of policies and procedures. So what we've also done, in addition to just meeting ISCM1's policies and procedures, and of course, giving you the system of quality management, we've also added additional content to, to basically just help you to get your policies and procedures for EQRs or for ISCM2 into the system as quickly and effectively as possible. So just to note there that you will still need specific procedures and probably working papers in your audit methodology. And that has been provided for in Audit International, for example, in our South African methodology, the Probe Audit Premium Plus methodology. But in terms of your system itself, you also need the policies and procedures. And so that you can then easily get within the SQM app. ISO 220 is not really catered for in ISQM 1, of course, or rather in SQM. If you want to add additional policies or procedures, you're welcome to do that. But the ISO 220 requirements are really actually met through procedures and documentation within your methodology. But that really was the driving force thing. Firstly, ISQM 1, and then really we're just expanding from there to help firms with their system of quality management and their policies and procedures, tracking that the, those procedures are being complied with. All right, the objective of ISQM 1, just so that we're all on the same page. Remember, the standard requires you, the firm to design implement and then operate the system of quality management um, for all engagements that are relevant that is performed by the firm so that and they to me it's always important to note that firstly the firm and their staff must fulfill the responsibilities in terms of the standard and they I often think of firm level type of requirements and then of course the second part is that the engagement reports need to be appropriate so they will have all of those firm-wide quality management procedures and policies your annual declarations your inducement registers um, consultation registers etc all right then is this really applicable to my firm? And again, saying big, large, small firms. Um, and even if you don't necessarily do audit work in your firm, this could still be applicable to you. So the general ISQM1 standard then says that any firm or person that performs audits of historical information, so your normal ISA audits, independent reviews in terms of ISREs, other assurance engagements, or even your related services, so your agreed upon procedures and your compilations, any firm that performs these procedures must then have an ISQM uh, 1 system or an SQM um, system of quality management. And of course, to be added to that then also is when we get to our sustainability assurance standards, that is also assuming that a firm has a system of quality management that is at least as strict or, or, or extensive as ISQM 1. So we could even add that in in time to come. All right. Then further, the standard requires, I would say, at least two responsibilities, but they actually then expand on it. So this is really what we've dealt or built into the system. So first of all, a person or a group of persons needs to take the ultimate responsibility and accountability for the firm's compliance with ISQC, ISQM1. Don't know where that C came in now. So that is normally then your CEO, perhaps a managing partner, or then if you've got a board of partners or, or, or a bigger group. So that would be the personal persons that's taking ultimate responsibility. That person is also then the person that's going to do the event evaluation at the end of the year, and that's very soon, eh? 15 December is around the corner, where the person will then perform the evaluation to say if the firm has complied and has achieved the objective of ISQM1. So the second person or responsibility or role that's required by ISQM1 is then the person that has the operational responsibility for the system of quality management. That's the person that will design, that will um, make sure the implementation is done, that the operation is working. I foresee that that person is going to spend a lot of time within the actual system or the manual or whatever the process is that you currently have. This is also then in an SQM environment, probably the person's going to do the bulk of the design work of the system in the SQM app. 
And then the standard goes further and says, you can also have specific persons that have operational responsibility for, let's say, for example, the monitoring or for the independence compliance, um, any of those individuals. So because the standard then mentioned those two examples, we also have made provision for those two. In time to come, you can have additional um, roles as well. But then where that thing fits into the actual SQM product, we've just given you this title to basically show you where those are. And you'll notice the little um, codes that we have at the end of the name. So the person with ultimate responsibility and accountability, we just refer to as the UR, and that thing probably being your CEO or your managing partner. The person with operational responsibility, OR, um, a partner, manager, maybe someone in your technical department, or if you've got a separate quality department, that person. And I'm talking one person, but you could also have more than one person. All right. So that is quite possible. And then the person with operational responsibility for independence, again, possibly a manager or partner, your person performing the monitoring work. And again, this could also be an external person, perhaps an external consultant, if you don't have your own monitoring department. And then all your other users, every single other person in the firm will then just be one of your, I want to call it your normal users, but let's then at least say without having specific responsibilities within the product. Okay, then, how does SQM help us comply? Now, most of you would know that SQM basically, or ISQM1, requires a firm to firstly have a risk assessment process, or a FRAP, some of us refer to it, by which you then perform risk and design responses for those six pillars in the, in the standard. And those are then all those little funny little things in the little circle, the relevant ethical requirements, the resources, the governance and leadership, all of those those. Um, Parts. And then, of course, almost as a as a catch all to have the monitoring and remediation within the process as well to say, not only do we check and we assess and we identify risks and we, we, we implement procedures, but we also then come and see that our procedures are actually working effectively. So that is everything is actually accommodated for um, in the SQM app. Now, how do we do that? So within SQM, in terms of the FRAP, we give you a provision to actually document your understanding of both your firm and its, and its engagements. And you can update that as you go along. So whether you update it once a month, once a year, every six months, whatever it is, you can update it as and when it gets necessary. You then establish your quality objectives. You identify your risks and assess them. You implement or first design and implement your responses, your procedures, your, your policies. And then you evaluate whether this is actually achieving the outcome um, that you were trying to achieve. So all of that is included in the SQM. We do that through the five main modules that Ricky also mentioned. Um, just one thing, of course, is that you'll be doing your settings or your, your initial setup in settings. But then after that, you'll have this iterative process within the five modules being design, operate, operate, overview, monitor, and evaluate. And, and I'll show you in the demo that we're going to start soon. I will show the, um, the interaction between all of those, those modules. All right. Um, Good. I see there is a question about the slides. Um, I think that's fine. We can definitely uh, provide the slides. I was just concerned that maybe th there was a, a crucial point. But yes, I'm, I'm happy to share the slides. Good. Um, then I want us to start with a demo. So jumping into the product to actually see what it looks like. And yeah, I'm going to actually now switch off my camera, if you'll excuse me, because I need to look at the, at the next screen and I want to make sure that I don't miss anything that I want to show you um, so that we can really experience the product um, optimally. So what I'm currently showing you is the operate module. And you are seeing the part where you will always land on the product when you get into SQM. So I'll know that I'm in SQM by seeing the little block on the left hand side. If I needed to get to it, you would always go down to the burger menu, go find SQM, click on it, and that's where you will land. All right. So this is the, the module that all your staff will always have access to. So if you have set up a user in case for cloud and you have given them the app specific access without special access, then this will always be the part that they've got access to. Why? Well, because all staff members need to be able to actually see your firm's system. So that's your SOQM. 
And India, you can see I've already published a, a system, a very small system at this point in time, but I can see that I've got an objective, I've got a risk policy procedure, and even a task that's linked to that. So this is my new manual or quality manual, if you want. All right, and there's different functions that I can look at it and so forth. But that's just the first part where we will land. The rest of the stuff is the responsibilities. We'll, we'll, you'll understand what we talk about very soon. But this is really where the guys are going to operate on a day-to-day -day basis using the product. If we start, however, and we're going to start designing our system, the people that will be responsible for designing and maintaining the system are the users that will have access to the design mode. So I want to stress here that your, your staff that only has to operate will, will not even see the spot. They will literally only see the tabs that is applicable to them. The rest will all be hidden away. So for those individuals like your UR with ultimate responsibility, your OR with operational responsibility, those users will have access to all of these little um, menus. So first thing that you need to do is to actually include your responsibilities and allocate these four roles that we've identified to an individual or individuals. Now, I've just added myself and given myself all of the, the responsibilities, which is probably a bit un, unrealistic, but um, you'll have more than one person here. Yeah, of course, if you are the only person in the firm, that's probably fine. What I would possibly expect is that someone else is probably going to be doing the monitoring of my firm. But it's very easy. You literally just click to, to sign off that you've, you've accepted the responsibility. Someone else actually accepted that that I can do that, um, uh, fulfill those responsibilities. I could delete it. I can simply edit it. And that's simply where I can go and actually add it as well if I needed to. All right. So that's your responsibilities. Not so much um, any, any, I almost want to call it day-to-day -day responsibilities, but really indicating how you are meeting those roles from ISQM1. Setup is almost where I start to get excited because this is where I'm really modifying the system for my firm. So first of all, you would remember that I mentioned a number of languages and different standards that we accommodate. So this is where you will indicate which of those standards are you going to apply. In other words, which of those versions of the content should actually show in your system. So you can easily select more than one. Let's say, for example, I might choose BRE and South Africa as an example. Then that will be perfectly fine and the content for both of them will show. Okay. I want to only show the BRE ones today. So we're going to do one for the UK. We're selecting the, the British English, um, which is really based on the standard global ISQM1, but we are reflecting British English language, so spelling really. Um, as opposed to American English. Then I sign that off and now the product will know going forward that this is the, the content that must show. All right, next up is the risk assessment. I mentioned the risk matrix earlier on. So we, you will probably know by now that when you are assessing risks for quality objectives not being achieved, you'll know that you need to consider the probability of the risk actually occurring as well as the effect that those risks will actually have on your achievement of the quality objectives. And so depending on the five options that you can choose in the drop down menus in the risk um, assessment parts, this part is where the firm will decide and say, in order to ensure a consistent application of the risk assessment framework, when someone chooses rare and insignificant, we will always have very low and you can modify them as you wish. So anything between very low up to high, those options are available to you. And then the next part is to say, right, what is medium going to mean in my firm? What response will I require when there is a medium risk or a high risk or a low risk? And that's really what we've documented here in the bottom is to say response required for very low. That's basically where we say this is not a quality risk. So no response is required or moderate or significant, the applied judgment is to say, mm, sometimes this might be a little bit, of, you know, we're not sure where to go. So let's apply our judgment in that instance. The firm can choose not to even have applied judgment appear at all if, if you don't want to. Okay. So that's really um, where you can set up your own risk assessment policy within your system. Sign off again. I've already signed it off. And then we move on to design understanding. Now, design understanding is the part where we are going to document what 
is our firm. This is where we need to understand or document our understanding of the firm itself and the type of engagements that the firm performs. So you'll see a list of questions here. And it's really, again, based on the themes from the standard, where we've added in a lot of additional questions for you to consider um, to help you to identify risks and also where you are identifying risks to help you to identify the assessment of those risks and possibly even uh, appropriate responses. All right. As you complete each of these questions, you'll simply sign them off as they are completed. Um, we, we refer to these as um, simple questions. So you can just click yes or no, yes or no. Or you can, of course, in some cases, you'll fill in the answers. Once you are done working through your understanding, someone, possibly your person with ultimate responsibility, will review this with your recorded objectives, risks, etc. And then basically sign off and say, I've reviewed and I'm comfortable that we've identified all the objectives and all the risks so that we have uh, just someone checking on the completeness of that. And that person really signs off there and that's all done and dusted. Right, so you can see it is iterative. We can go back and forth, back and forth, but that's then the understanding. The next ones are really where we're going to add our content to build our system. We've got the objectives, risks, policies, procedures, and tasks. Now, maybe just to stress the difference between a policy procedure and a task. So the policy responses are where we say we have a risk, how is the firm going to respond to this? Well, we've got a policy to say we have to complete annual declarations. Or we've got a policy to say whenever somebody gets offered a gift, they need to go look at the gift policy and then follow a certain approval process before they can or maybe cannot accept the gift. So that's the policy. The procedure then is to say that's how we're going to respond to the risk. But what is it that we actually do? And that's the procedure. So we're going to complete uh, uh, the gift register. We're going to get approval, things like that. That's the procedure response. Now, task is not something from ISQM1. That is an SQM um, feature. And the task is really using the, the, the technology to basically replace a Word-based, Excel-based, hard copy, whatever else it is that you're using to currently record uh, gifts currently um, have the staff complete annual declarations or complete a register of consultations, any of those things. But if you're using currently, the tasks should be able to replace that. So it's a form, we call it a JSON form, really just technology, um, where you can literally design your own form, your own records that you can get staff to then complete. And then you have a lovely register of all the declarations that's completed with all the detail you want uh, or your, your register with your, your uh, gift register or your consultations register or whatever it is that you need. All right. Um, and then, yeah, then we'll, we'll get to the review and the publish. But now let's start with the objectives. So in most of these cases, you will see a variety. If I show you, for example, in the types here, we have I just want to give it a moment to sync. So currently we only have mandatory and network items in the objectives. So the firm here has not designed their own extra objectives. The network told me you shall have the following objective at least, and that one is reflected. And then the mandatory ones are the ones from ISQM1, that where the, where the standard also says these objectives. If a firm had added any additional ones, there would also be a type that's just called firm. So especially where you've got additional risks, additional policies or procedures, those ones will all be firm types. Okay, so just in case you notice the different um, categories here. Right, then you could also have the library. So that's a little plus sign there. And depending on where you are on the product, you'll see different things that you can add. In this case, we can add any of the items in the design mode. When we get to monitor, for example, I can add additional monitoring activities and I can add additional monitoring work programs. Um, and so it really depends on where I am. If I'm an operator, I can add an additional task where I'm going to complete a form. In our example, you'll see that I completed the gift register for a, a gift that I received from a client. So that's really what this little plus button is for. So I can go and use this to then add anything. And also just maybe to show you from just the risk, for example, 
So that's where I will access my library to see, hmm, let's go see what is already in the content. And there I can really scroll down and see whatever is in there and select the relevant one that I want to record. All right. So that, that's how you will access your library. And I promise you there are hundreds of risks, policies, procedures, monitoring activities. For the objectives, we only went with a bare minimum. There was a bit of a discussion to say, should we have additional ones? And really, every single one of the possible objectives that we had considered, we could always slot into one of the minimum or standard objectives from the standard. So we decided to just go with the standard ones. What I want to show you today is one of the ones from the relevant ethical requirements. And these really are just the, the individual codes that we've given the items um, because every item has a unique ID. So in today's example, I'm going to show you the process that we followed for ultimately ensuring that whenever a staff member gets or gives a, a gift or any other inducement to a client or another person, that the gift register is completed. So the one objective that I identified there is the one for 1.2 um, that says the firm and its personnel fulfill their responsibilities with regards to the relevant ethical requirements to which the firm and the firm's engagements are subject. And so what I've already completed here in the dialogue, we can even open the actual dialogue. I've just signed it off already. But what I can see in the dialogue is that it's got a title. There you can see it's a mandatory one. If I said, let's say, for example, with supervision of staff, I'm a one man show. I, I run my firm by myself. I don't have any other staff. What I would have done with those objectives from ISKM1 that says uh, direction, supervision, et cetera, I would have simply come here and said, no, it's not relevant. There'd be a field to say, why is it not relevant? I'll document there and that's it. It doesn't even continue into my system because I've said I am not, I don't have any staff. So that's not relevant. Okay. Um, the component is really one of those links. I'll, my documented objective is in there and I can then complete a few things. Paragraph references if I want, if I want to link it to any other documents or things like that. Um, and then maybe one thing also to note here yeah, that is applicable to every single one of the other dialogues is the effective from date and the effective to date. So let's say, for example, I've done my system and now as part of my monitoring this year in October, I'm identifying additional objectives, risks, policies, any of those things that I want to add. But I don't want them to be effective from today when I'm recording this item. So I say, guys, we're going to actually implement all changes to the system by 1 November, 1 December, 1 January, whatever the date is that you choose. Then I will say, yes, I might complete all of this. I might even publish it, but it will only be effective from specific date when everybody must then comply with this new process, this new policy, whatever the case may be. That's the effective from. Otherwise, if you want it to be available, active the moment you publish, you can just leave it blank. And the same with the effective two. So the effective two is basically a sunset date. When I replace one procedure with another procedure, or when I decide that a specific risk is no longer applicable within my firm, then I will really just have an effective two date if I don't want to delete it immediately and say, well, it's still applicable until the end of this year, December, but come January next year, this is no longer going to be a process for us. So then I can really just include that sunset date and it will automatically basically disappear from the system, or if it's a task, it will no longer be available in the system from that sunset date. So I don't then have to remember on that exact date, oh yes, these 15 policies need to disappear today, or those that has to appear or anything like that. I've done my work already. So every single item that I want to publish has to then be signed off by a person, and then we can move on to the risks. Now, risks, does not have any mandatory risks in the standard. The standard says you've got your objectives and you need to see if anything can go wrong with your firm not achieving those objectives. So you'll see that there's only firm type risks here. And these ones I've added from the library of risks. And you will add lots and lots and lots here to make sure that you cover all the objectives, all the type of services that you provide, every single type of thing that you can think of. All right. So in here, I've already got another one, but specifically for the inducements and the gifts, I've added a risk here and I want to show you what the dialogue will look like where we're going to actually do our risk assessment today. So I've added in the risk from the library. The risk is even in here because it's not a mandatory one. I can even change the wording for my firm if I wanted to. I'm just going to type some blah, blah, blah there so you can see. 
I can even add an additional description if I wanted to. This one is especially a helpful one if it is a network identified risk, because then I cannot change the actual risk wording, but I can then say, how is this even more specific in our own firm? The, the standard is already selected. If I want to include a paragraph reference, that's all fine. I can also include URLs to, must, to somewhere else. And this could be on cloud, or it could even be to your SharePoint or any other URL that you want to include. So that's also quite helpful if you want to refer someone to minutes of a meeting or, I don't know, findings in a monitoring review, something like that. And then these two fields here is really what is only effective because we've done our setup earlier to say, these are the five options that I have, and those options are what is the possibility, and we had, well, rarely, unlikely, possible, et cetera. And then I've got, well, minor impact, moderate impact, et cetera. And depending on those two responses, you can see the risk assessment result. And secondly, when I have a medium, what is the response required? Well, everybody's going to have me moderate response required because in the firm setup, we said that's how we do it. If I change any of these, let's say insignificant and the result is low, this is where we then get that apply your judgment option. And then the firm or the person completing it will then have to say, okay, what is the response required? Okay, it is apply judgment, but we're not going to respond at all. Or it is apply judgment, we're going to respond with only a moderate or even a significant response and then actually document there your reason. All right, for the sake of time, I'm just putting a word there. Then you can link policies and procedures yeah, already if they have been designed, but you can also later on when you are designing your policy, say, so, oh, which risk is linked here? That's the risk that I'm linking here. In the same way that I've also right at the top linked an objective here to say, I'm coming from the objective, I'm going to the policy, and that's where we go. Right, so there's a lot of information here. Again, an effective from, effective to, and I can then just sign off this risk here and say, great, we are ready to go. There we go. And close the risk dialog. So everything is also reflected here in a little card. But if I wanted to view it after it's signed off, or if I wanted to edit it, unsign, and then go and have a look at it. All right, so we've got two risks going in today. Then the policy response, remember now this is saying, okay, we've got a risk, we have to respond to this risk. How is the firm actually going to address this risk? And in this case, I already have a lot of mandatory responses. So I can go into the responses and say, well, I know it's got something to do with inducements. And let's see if there are any items in terms of inducements, right? There is one. Now you can see it's a firm type. So obviously it wasn't a requirement, it wasn't a mandatory one. I'd already gone before and to the library and included this one for us. The policy response, just to see, so it is relevant for us. And there is the document to say the firm applies the conceptual framework. I'd already linked the risk where we came from just now, and I've already linked the procedure as well. We're going to look at that procedure just now. Okay, and I'll do that for every single one of the risks. So in the SQM uh, methodology, it is to say every risk has a policy and then a procedure. Um, the standard doesn't require that, but we find that that's just easiest if you have a policy that says this is how we're going to do it, and then you've got the procedure that says what you're going to do. And we've also developed the content in that format so that you can easily find them. So now we're going to go and say, what is it that staff is going to do when they do have an inducement or a gift? And so again, I can really go into the the title and say inducements. Is there something in inducements as a mandatory? Perhaps there wasn't one. I included it from the library and now we've got it here. So this is a procedure response. Let's have a look at the procedure response because this year again requires some specific modification for your firm. Or well, let's say it gives you a choice to modify it as you wish. So again, just the information about what it is that we're going to do, applicable standard, and then links if you want. Again, that's the linked task. So we're going to complete that form. What is the nature of your response? And there's some guidance here to say, well, what, how are you going to do this? Is it going to be preventative, detective, or a combination of those two of responses? Are you going to use a manual process? Are you going to use technology? Do you require additional resources? Maybe you need to purchase additional software or licenses or something to actually implement the process. So one of the considerations there was just to say, well, we're going to do this using the SQM app. All right. And now the software says, right, so how are you going to do this? This is a gift register. So I'm going to, I can't guess 
how often people is, are going to get gifts or going to offer clients gifts. I also can't guess who's going to offer or get the gifts. So I'm going to make it a manual process. And manual really means that nobody's going to be prompted to complete the document whenever they get the gift because the system cannot guess when that happens. But with something like, for example, your annual declaration process, where you say, well, once a year, I'm going to send a declaration process and every single staff member has to complete that declaration at that point in time. Well, that's easy. Then I can actually schedule it. And what happens with scheduling is then I can go and set the frequency. And um, this year, I then have the option to schedule tasks to happen daily, every first, second, third, 15th, whatever day, every 10 days, every 20 days. Uh, I can choose a specific weekday to actually happen. I can choose to have it weekly, every Thursday, every whatever. Monthly, I could have it every first day of the first day of the first month or every first week of the, the Monday of every first week of whatever month, every second month. You really have options. And, and I promise you, when the design team came up with this, I really tried to actually come up with something that is not accommodated in this format. And I couldn't come up with something. So really, whatever your combination is in terms of your frequency, I'm sure you're going to be able to find it in there. All right. But for us gifts, I want to make it manual. Before I move on from this, though, the exciting or the, the really, really cool feature here is that if you've scheduled it like that, no one has to remember, oh, it's the 1st of January, we need to send our declaration to the staff. It's going to appear in their task list at 10 o'clock on that day where you have scheduled it. So the trick is just that it only happens at 10 o'clock. So you've got to schedule it the day before at least and publish your system and then it will actually happen. The next part also to remember is that this is the procedure that will actually issue it, but you still have to have the form, which I'm going to show you soon, that is the thing that will be sent to them. So only a signed off procedure that's scheduled and a linked form, that's the task, only then will the item actually appear in the inboxes. Okay, next up we can say who's it responsible to? Well, is it only the leadership? Is it the firm personnel? Is it the service provider? Nothing really happens from this, but it just helps you to think really about how, how you have designed this response, what is actually happening. Extend, is it going to happen for all staff or if it's something that happens at engagement level, is it for all engagements? If not, you're going to document a selection and so while it's only going to be the audit engagements, not the whatever engagements, um, whatever you, you feel is relevant. So again, just helping you to think about what it is that you're designing. Then you can either assign it to individuals or you can assign it to groups of staff. And these really are the groups from the Caseway Cloud group sector. So I've just allocated it to all staff to say everybody, whenever they get a gift, have to complete a gift um, a register entry. So I can sign it off. We're going to make it effective the moment we publish it. Everybody has to complete that. So that's all good and well. Right, then the tasks. So there I've already completed our gift task for us. I've also completed one with regards to the annual declaration. So let me maybe just quickly show you the um, gifts example. So remember, this is the task is where we are designing the actual form. So there's a little bit of information there. But then the exciting part for me, let me just unsign this quickly. I want us to just quickly see the form. So this is, is really the document where we are going to design the form. And you literally take a field and you drag and drop it and then you change stuff on it, etc. Okay, but what we've of course done is we've already included some of these tasks for you where I've already included what the content that should be in there. So there you've got um, the form editor now in there and I'll just have a look at this. So the name, the name of the client, little drop downs, um, was the gift offered by or to the client, little yeses and nos and all kinds of things, the value, the date, then you can select it. So it really is very, very user friendly in terms of how you can set this up. Um, and as long as this is, of course, linked to that procedure and the procedure is scheduled, it's going to automatically then that form is going to appear in the staff members um, list. All right. So then we've I'm just going to sign the second one off as well. That's then the design of our system. And then we go to the review and publish. So this is the draft system of quality management. And this is where we can see everything that's linked to each other. The right hand also here, you can see the types and so forth. And then I just want to show you these little uh, columns. Um, 
this is where you almost hold up your breath for a moment and think, is it going to work? Yes, it's going to work. If I've got warnings here, sometimes like little yellow trial angles, those ones will just appear to say, you have a policy, but you haven't linked a procedure. Or you have a procedure, but you haven't linked a task. Those ones are saying you can go ahead, but there is something that you might be wanting to improve in your system. So that's not the end of the world. However, if you, for example, have a I don't know, a risk or a procedure or anything underneath this that's not linked to an objective, the system is going to actually block you. And so you cannot approve and, and publish this. You cannot actually finalize the system because you've got stuff that's not linked to objectives. And ISQM1 says everything works from the objective. The objective is what drives it. So now that we know that everything is nicely done yeah, of course, I don't have all the objectives, but we're not going to do all of that today. Once I've got everything, I'm comfortable. I know everything is there. I'm going to click approve. The system will check that everything's working and it's approved. There we see, you can see that I approved it today. And then I will publish it from my draft or uh, design mode to the operate so that all of this is also available to my staff. Are you sure you want to publish? Yes. And then... They will notify me your, your system has been published and now my staff can see everything that's in the draft system. What they cannot see are any of the objectives that's not signed off. So anything that's still in draft format or anything like that, they will never see. But everything that I've signed off that I'm happy that's ready to go, that's been published to the system of quality management. Just a quick note there, if I need to export, there's an export button, especially then done for the networks, to then export this into a separate file. We call that an SQMEX file. It's exactly the type of, of file that's required to import the information into the system for each of those individual network member firms who will then import it um, for their network requirements. All right. So now that we've done the design, we've done the majority of the work. So I can also, from the design perspective, see the monitoring reports, and I can also see monitoring activities that have been designed. Because remember also, in terms of designing your system, you should have also designed your monitoring activities. However, the monitoring activities design is sitting in the monitoring uh, tab or module because we, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about where will this be most appropriate. And often what we found is that the monitoring person, the one that's actually going to do the monitoring, might need to add additional monitoring activities that we may not necessarily have thought of in the design mode site, a stage when we were designing just to monitor the compliance and um, with the procedures that we developed, et cetera. So they might want to do other stuff, select three files or check for this also. Or, oh, we saw that the, the regulator was also worried about cash flow uh, statements or things like that. And then they add additional monitoring procedures in there. All right, so operate. This is where we then see our system and I can either just literally open up everything like that. And then you can see objective and all the content below that objective. Or I could say, well, I actually just want to see which are the risks. Well, this risk looks interesting. Let's see what we've got there. So that's how the staff will basically read it. Responsibilities that just see, oh, who is the person responsible for the stuff? This is what I've seen. And then I get to the tasks. Now, this is the place where I will then complete forms for the firm. You can see that I've already submitted some. I've already submitted a gift uh, from client X. Um, I was busy when I joined the firm just this morning. I joined the firm and I was then asked to complete the annual declaration. But because I hadn't actually been with the firm at the beginning of the year, um, I'm now completing the annual declaration at the point of joining the firm. Next year, January, there will be a new one that's going to appear and it will be called automatic or scheduled. And that will then also be there for me to complete. All right, now just to quickly show you the gift room, we, we saw what it looked like before when we designed the system. If I'm now a staff member and I'm now having to complete this actual form, this is what it will look like for me to complete. So again, you can see that it's in progress. That's really the normal case with cloud stuff. And yeah, I can complete. I've already completed that. And I can select whether it's a gift by or to a client. What is the, the, the gift that I've got? Did I consider it? And I can literally just complete the stuff um, and, and then submit it. Okay, so that's quite, quite helpful and easy and quick to do. I didn't submit it now, otherwise it would have changed to submission. 
findings is something that we'll look at very soon when we're actually going to work through the monitoring stage. So, so we'll get back to that, but that is the user, let's say the audit manager, for example, who's not part of the monitoring work, but my file gets reviewed and I get a query from the monitoring procedure. And then this is where I will deal with those points. Because again, I'm not going to see the other modules. Then if I am perhaps a partner or HR or anybody like that, that needs to monitor that certain of those tasks are being performed, I may be given access to operate overview where I will say, well, let's see how many people have completed their annual declaration. So that, that task was sent out. We want to see how many people have completed it. And, oh, I see. So firstly, don't be worried. There's a lot of information in this declaration. I've really put in a lot of stuff in there. So let me just quickly switch off some of these columns so that we don't have so much content. Um, I, can, I can choose which columns to show. And so you can immediately see, well, either way, you can see there's only one line that's actually completed in there. And I can even make some of the columns bigger and smaller. Okay. So I can see Joanna has gotten hers. I can see, hey, she hasn't submitted it. It's still in progress. All right. So obviously, if the deadline for submission has come and gone, she hasn't done it yet. How will I follow up on it? Well, obviously, I can hit Slack or Teams or whatever it is that I want. Or I can just go and say, well, task discussion, let's use the case with client functionality to collaborate and say, hey, you've missed your deadline. What's happening here? Okay. In time to come, I'm dreaming of all kinds of other automation to say, well, this needs to be done by a certain day. And then those people will get reminders or we will actually notify their uh, superiors, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all stuff that I'm still dreaming of. All right. Monitoring then. This is now uh, the monitoring module is there where the person or persons that will be performing the monitoring reviews will be have access to. The, the UR, the person with ultimate responsibility, will have access to. And potentially, if, if a design person may need access to it, that, that might also be um, maybe the op person with operational responsibility to go and see the report. So, for example, where we were in design and we said monitoring reports, those also go to monitoring. That's where the reports are. Okay. But what, what's the process that we follow in monitoring? So in monitoring and remediation, again, there's an understanding bit. Now, this understanding bit is different to design understanding. In design understanding, we had to document our understanding of the firm and its engagements in order to identify the objectives, risks, assess the risks, and design the responses. In the monitoring module, we now have to understand the firm and its engagements and how the firm actually designed their system so that we can evaluate if they have complied with the standard, if they have appropriately identified and assessed risks, if they have appropriately designed responses, and then whether they actually complied with their design policies and procedures. So it's almost like the client, um, when, when we're auditing clients and we say, have you identified all the control weaknesses and implemented responses to those, controls to those? And then only do we say, well, let's go test the controls that were implemented. Okay, that's really what monitoring does here. So this is what the design is about. There's, again, a number of questions. Again, you can link little URLs to policies, procedures, documents, whatever it is that you need for any of these. So it's really just to give you a quick space to document the relevant points. What we've also given you access to here is, is just a report of every single approved and published objective, risk, policy procedure task that is not already addressed through a monitoring activity. Because even though you may not be performing a monitoring activity for every single one of the policies and procedures every single year, part of your design of your system says that you must already design your monitoring activities. So the, the, the uh, philosophy then is that you will design your monitoring activities and we'll see how we're going to do that just now for every single one of the items or elements in your system of quality management. So let's have a look at that then. So I'll technically have to continue until my report to mon of not monitored is blank. That's how, how many procedures I need to develop. Of course, you can combine the stuff. You'll see just now. But this is checking that I have enough and all the monitoring activities that I needed to design. 
If we then go to monitoring activities, I've already designed one for the annual declaration. So let's quickly see one for the inducements again. So there's one that I've designed and we said, well, what's the area that we're testing for? So yeah, we've got the, um, from the standard also to say, in some cases, you're going to be monitoring the design of the system. In some cases, you're going to be monitoring whether the policies and procedures have been implemented. In some cases, you're going to actually monitor the evaluation of last year. So, so that's the area that's relevant there. Then in some cases, you're going to review at firm level, ISQM1 compliance, and in some cases, you're going to review audit files or review files, so engagement levels. And when we get to developing work programs very soon, we want to be able to actually filter all the available monitoring activities according to those. And of course, again, also the, the pillar, the relevant ethical requirements. So here, this is the procedure for the monitoring procedure obtained for the monitoring period, rather obtained and review the registered and so forth and so forth and so forth. We said a manual instance, um, and we're going to test all the entries in the register. And then here, I've linked all of the relevant elements, the objective, the risk, the policy, etc. And so that's why if you were to go and check, none of these would be in my uh, report of not monitored under the understanding tab. All right, so this is one of my monitoring activities. Um, you, you will then have a monitoring activity for each of them. So we've only now included one for inducements. So I can almost bet you if we were to go and see if the annual declaration procedures are in understanding, you'd probably see that they are um, not yet monitored. So if we just say declaration, there you can see there's my uh, procedures for the annual declaration. They're actually not um, or not not monitored yet, so I still need to go and design that that monitoring activity. Right, and again, I think I showed this to you earlier on. That's where I can then in the monitor tab or in the monitor uh, module I develop my monitoring activities and a monitoring work program. So I've already developed monitoring work programs for us. There were two for for engagement files. The one was completed. The one still needs to be done. So I really like the color coding here. And then we also did some monitoring in October to check for compliance with relevant ethical requirements. So there I included an item on inducements and um, just one on, on annual declarations. Um, I think I actually, yeah. All right. And then for one, I hadn't actually completed it yet. So that's why you still saw it in orange in progress. But then, yeah, I'd actually raised a finding to say, well, the new staff didn't complete the, the declaration. And as the person doing the monitoring, I raised the finding, uh, I linked it to, to the relevant um, um, ID, I gave it an ID, et cetera. And then I said, who's the person that's responsible? Who must answer to this? And now just to make it easier for me to jump within the product, I assigned it to myself and I said, you, know, you better go tell us why that new staff joining not complete the annual declaration. That was part of our system. All right. Then I sent the, the response and the rest of the stuff would have been blank. Then what happens on your nice side? Well, as the HR manager or whatever it is, I would have gotten a notification to say there's a finding raised for your for your eyes, for your action. So yeah, I would then have had a little pen sign there to go and see it. So I've already submitted the response, which is why I have the little I sign there. I just want to show you what this looks like then. So as the audit manager with a query on my audit file or the HR manager or the quality manager, whoever it is, that person will then see this is the finding raised by the monitoring person. This is the finding and I will then have this field to document why was this an issue. Okay, we're not at root cause analysis yet. We're just simply saying this is a finding. That's the finding that there was. Then the back in the monitoring, once that monitoring person they can either then through the work programs go and see the issue or from the findings they can then see, okay, this was the case. They'll open up this little um, dialogue and they'll see, okay, so there's the response from the person. Is that good enough? Maybe she made a mistake. Maybe the answer is not good enough. And I want to go further and discuss it further. I can either ask them in person, I can use collaborate and I come up with a better understanding or another person's input. And I can then include a summary of the response. Then after that, I decide, is this finding actually a deficiency? Yes. If not, no document, why not? Okay, so not every finding is a deficiency. And then I will determine why is it a deficiency and what is the severity and the pervasiveness and ultimately the effect on the system of quality management. And this is just the requirement from the standard and how we've implemented it. 
Then because this is a deficiency, now we need to go do root cause analysis and come up with an action for this. And there again, I've allocated it to myself. You can allocate it to another person if you need to. And then basically signed off this finding. Again, on the user side, they will get a finding um, to say that da, 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 there you've given your response, but now you need to come and give us a remedial action. All right, so then another field opens up and I'll go and do my root cause analysis. I'll determine what the root cause analysis is or the root cause is and what the remedial action is going to be. And this year now, I have document, I've seen the finding, I've seen the response that someone else had, and now I'm going to document the remedial actions. So I've added two here just so that you can see that you can add additional ones and you can also link them. So let me just show you what the field looks like. In the remedial action, you'll document your root cause. Now, my root cause is really just a blurb, okay? Your proper root cause after either following your five whys or the fish um, or, or whatever the framework is that you use to do your root cause analysis. You'll document your remedial action and that's the part that will then flow through to the report of the remedial action, okay? So you can link, the link means that if I've already identified a remedial, a, a root cause with a remedial action and it's applicable to more than one finding, then I can actually just link a previously documented one to this one. And I don't have to have then five root cause analysis with five responses that has exactly the same point. Okay, so that's also quite, quite helpful. Then I submit that and then that's the, the remedial action documented. Again, that's the manager level, the HR level, whatever that level would be. Okay, so that's submitted. I can close the field. That's all done. And now you can only see it. You can't change it. Good. Back to the monitor. The monitor has completed the finding, signed off the finding. The monitor can then see the remedial actions. And yeah, you'll see I've got two because I linked them. Um, but they, that's then the remedial action that says, well, that was the root cause, that was the remedial action. And what's really nice here is you can actually export this to Excel, share it with your staff and things like that. So, so it's, it's, it's supposed to be, because there's a lot of requirements in the standard that talks about communication, communication, communication these functionalities are then enabled through exporting and communicating it to the relevant people. At the same time, the monitor or the evaluator or the persons in design can actually go and draw a variety of reports about the monitoring activities that were formed. So let's say I want to see a report of all monitoring activities. Okay, and then there's my three work programs and I can see the monitoring uh, the procedures, sorry, the activities for that monitoring work program. There was the, those were the monitoring activities. Was there finding raised? Yes. The, everything about the stuff, is it a deficiency, et cetera? That's the remedial action. So I can literally go and see everything for every one of them. If I wanted to, I could, of course, also just filter according to the objective or a specific risk or a policy or a procedure, et cetera. Especially if my remedial action is ooh, we need to go and add an extra risk for what, 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 or we need to change the policy for this policy or something, then I can filter by policy, procedure, et cetera, and immediately go and action it from there. Right, so that's monitor. And then lastly, just evaluate. Evaluate is, is actually the critical part, but it does look like a short part when we are just um, looking at it in the demo. So the evaluate is now the pl place where the person performing the op ultimate has the ultimate responsibility and accountability that person is basically putting pen to paper assigning a i think of it as a mini audit opinion but it's actually a very big opinion here without signing off and saying does our firm's system of quality management at this point in time actually achieve the objective of isqm1 um, in other words, is it helping our staff and our firm to comply with all our relevant requirements and are the engagements reports that we sign appropriate? Okay, so that, that's really what you're concluding on here. So you've got the link, the shortcut link to the reports to be able to see what those monitoring activities and the findings and all of that was. Um, and then you've got your evaluate programs. So as we said earlier on, you can use the plus sign to create new ones. So this year I created the October evaluation. Next year I'll create the next one. If I do an evaluation every three months, I can use one every three months as is necessary. 
it, it's it's a standard one um, that's created. And the benefit or the purpose of this is rather than having a work program where you need to sign off 10 or 15 little points to say, I've done this, yes, I've done this, yes, I've done this, that. This is designed and documented as a declaration, but with guidance to tell you what you should do or should have done. Um, and then even here where there's additional guidance to say, how can if I do have items that are severe but not pervasive or severe and pervasive, there's my guidance about how can I then determine what the appropriate conclusion is going to be. So all of that is there. It confirms that the evaluation has been done within 12 months that I've documented. So a reminder, have you documented your evaluation and so forth? And then also that I'm going to specifically communicate to the engagement and the individual is assigned with all of the responsibilities within the system. For example, your EQRs also need to know what is relevant to them. So all of those things is, is documented there. And then I will conclude about the deficiencies that were identified. And you've got your different options here. If they are severe and pervasive, and if they are um, then concluded as being, let's say it's terrible, Okay, it's it's really terrible. And we say, well, actually, the firm doesn't provide us with, with um, the option. The, the, e, the UR then has the option to actually go and record specific deficiencies. They can then actually go and, and re add their own um, identified deficiency allocated to the responsible body. Same thing, but that is then what happens here. Let me show you in the evaluate actions part, which is then in addition to just what the monitor has already done. But ultimately, the evaluate program, if it's, well, not perfect, but still good, or absolutely awesome, neither severe nor pervasive, or uh, severe but not pervasive, any of those options, you'll still be able to conclude and say, happiness, you sign off and you say, well, I've done my evaluation, it was created, when was it last updated? And then anybody can see this was the evaluation that was done. You go through the whole process again next year, you come to your evaluate again. And that's really the product. So, yeah. Any questions, Perfect. any input from your side? Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, we do actually have a, a, a couple of questions in. Um, one of them is if uh, it says if ISQM1 UK available, I think that's meant to be is ISQM1 UK available? So um, there is a um, there is a, a, a future release where we're going to actually call it ISQM UK, but at the moment the content is exactly the same as for um, the setup where we used the BRE International. So there's there's currently no almost I want to call it local requirements from that. If if um, as soon as we get any local requirements or if you tell us of local requirements through Ricky or, or even through Hannah, then we can definitely incorporate those. Um, yeah, so so we can we can we can definitely add that in there at the moment, just the it's the UK or it's the, the British English that's available, but 100 percent compliant with ISQM1. Um, it's in there. Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, another question is, uh, must all my staff have access to, uh, to SQM? All right. Yes, that's a good one. So, yes, the staff should all have access. So, for example, the annual declaration, the benefit of SQM is that you can have all of the operations happen on SQM. So if your staff don't have access to SQM, firstly, the standard says you must communicate your system of quality management. And then you actually don't have a way of communicating that the old manual, which is now the system on on. Um, on SQM, you can't communicate that to them. They cannot complete their tasks online. So yes, it's quite important that every single staff member in your firm that needs to know of your system of quality management and perform responsibilities within SQM um, has an, a, a license to SQM, yes. Okay. And uh, sorry, I want to add to that. It's even possible that service providers may be given access to it. So maybe you've got an external person performing um, your monitoring in your firm. It's a consulting firm or someone like that that comes in every few months and they review files or they perform your, your firm-wide monitoring. Those people also need access to SQM because actually they, they can't monitor your compliance with your gift registers or, or see your monitoring activities, any of that, if they don't have access to SQM. Perfect. Um, we also have, uh, what's the difference between a procedure and a task? 
All right. So the procedures now is, um, if I just show you this, where the procedure then says, uh, sorry, a procedure is the is the actual task that says this is what we're going to go do. So, for example, here on the screen, you can see all personnel, network personnel, etc., will complete the firm's annual declaration. So that's what we're going to go do. But the task itself is then that form where we completed the form online on SQM. So the possibility could be to still maybe even as a first round of adoption, the firm could say, well, we're going to have the procedure which we might have even had in our old quality manual, um, but we're going to not necessarily have the form online on SQM right now. Um, I know a lot of firms last year when they were rushing to get onto SQM, they said, oh, no, this, these forms on the tasks are a little bit nerve wracking. Let's just get the procedures on and we complete our, our manual register still. And then during this past year, then after they've got the initial implementation, then they are migrating their registers onto the online system because of the automation and scheduling it etc and then they are doing those forms in the json format okay perfect uh oh, just got this one in um uh, i've already prepared a system of quality management with objectives uh, policy procedure etc um how can i incorporate those uh into sqm as part of my implementation of sqm so is that to do with like importing and exporting Yes, that's actually quite exciting because a lot of you would probably already have some kind of other uh, solution. And now to actually incorporate all of that, you don't want to start with a blank system. Like this morning when I literally uh, opened up this one and there was absolutely not a single risk in this little table and I almost got a little bit of a fright. You don't want to start from scratch now. So what is available is there's a, a functionality here through settings. Uh, let me just quickly go find... Oh, SQM. So there's an import function here. Let's just give it a moment. And there I actually have a little, uh, it's like an Excel template, but we call it an SQMEX tem template document. And so if I open that, that's where you can basically go and copy and paste all of your content. I just want to wait for the Excel to quickly open up. I think it's going to open up just now. It's another dialog. Okay, there we go. Let me just move it across for you. So this here then is then basically where you could go and drop all your objectives, all your risks, etc. in there and link your risks and your objectives. All those things can be dropped in there. And then you basically just import this file into SQM and everything's already in there. So you might still need to go and just do the selections for your risk assessment, et cetera, just to get all of the final stuff. But at least you don't start from a blank page and you can import it here and then it will be already included. Perfect. I think this next question kind of uh, relates to the previous one, but it's uh, if I have a, a network of firms, how will the network firm export and distribute the materials? I presume it's a quite similar. Yes, it's very similar. So, so this is where we will import it. You could also, especially if a network maybe has only three or four specific requirements, you might think, well, that's maybe a lot of effort. So if the firm then distributes it in another way, you can also add them manually one by one in the same way that we had the other dialogues. So you could also add them there or otherwise then follow the same import process that I showed you now with regards to the the firm stuff, the, the implementation. And then just from the other side, for the firm to export, you may remember in the design, review and publish, we had the option there to export everything in my network system to then distribute it to the, to the other firms. And remember, if the network, for example, picked let's say all five relevant standards or languages, and I'm importing it into my system, but I only use BRE, then if I select BRE for my firm system, it will basically hide everything else and I'll only see my ones. Okay, So I won't be bothered with the Greek or the uh, Portuguese or whatever other uh, content that's in there. I'll only see my own content. Okay. Um, and I think got the the last question on there. I think Ricky might have covered this, but it's, it's just in regards to kind of like the scope of the template to do with uh, the size of your firm compared to like a smaller firm compared to a larger firm. I take it SQM still relevant to both? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And so some of the uh, this, some of the policies and procedures obviously w- could very easily fall away. You could even have instances where if you don't do any audits, you only do let's say agreed upon procedures and compilations, maybe. And of course other consulting type work, then you might even have less procedures, less risks, etc. Um, the biggest example that I've often seen is, is sole proprietors, where the guys have only it's only me. I don't have any other staff, or maybe two persons, but no no trainees, no staff, it's just two partners, then a lot of the direction, supervision, review, all of those objectives, risks, et cetera, falls away. And so then you can just ignore all of that and just, just document what's relevant. Because ultimately the standard doesn't say that you need to document everything. It just says you need to have documentation of your objectives, of your risks, your policies, and of course, then that you, well, and procedures, and of course, evidence that you've performed those, that you've complied with them. Perfect. Um, they were all the questions. What I'll do is I'll take control of the screen, uh, pop the uh, slides back up, and we'll start to run through the outro process here. Um, if any questions do come in, in the meantime, I can always just jump over to them. So uh, uh, do feel free to use the Q&A button below, um, as you can see on screen there. I think you can see the screen. Perfect. Um, uh, just a, a quick shout out for any of our upcoming webinars. Do head to caseware.com uh, uh, dot now. Sorry, uh, forward slash UK resources and events, um, and and you'll find any of our all of our upcoming webinars and events on there. Uh, next slide we have here. And um, if you need any additional guidance uh, regarding SQM, it's a little bit different to the help dot caseware um, help site that we normally run with for the UK. Uh, the success.caseforafrica.com is a fantastic site. It's got a load of information on there, getting started guides um, and all the separate sections uh, uh, split out into their own uh, categories there as well. So do feel free to jump onto that site. It's all um, free to access that content as well. Um, in regards to, uh, before we say thank you, uh, just in regards to the recording for today, um, the recording will go up on our, our YouTube Caseware Client Services channel. Uh, that will be in the next, well, we aim to get them out within uh, two working days, um, but hopefully we'll get it out this afternoon for you after it's done its processing. Um, we'll also be releasing it on our uh, help.caseware site as an article uh, with any relevant links as well for handouts uh, if we get any questions in after the fact as well. Um, but for today, unless anyone else has got any questions, no, there's no more coming. Um, was there anything else anyone wanted to mention before we sign off today? Good. I think, James, if I can, I just want to say that the, the, I remember now that we also have a complete series of videos on YouTube, but you'll probably come across them also if you go to the Getting Started page on, on that success community, um, yeah, which is, it's exactly the same videos, but they, they're almost grouped into little bundles, so that could also be helpful for, for anybody that wants to see it. Perfect. I'll uh, I'll include the link on uh, on the help site article as well, so we'll get some more traction that way. And um, Ricky, is, is there anything else you want to mention today? No, uh, all good from me, James. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you to you both for for joining us in the webinar, and thank you for everyone for for watching today. I hope you have a, a great rest of your day. All the best.